Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India continue with today with uh, the spectral analysis. So, in the last class uh, we have seen how what are the parameters required for acquiring data and what are the important points for processing. Uh, so, we will now start with how do we interpret an NMR spectrum, 1D proton spectrum, uh, how do we analyze that data. So, let us start from 1D proton NMR. So, as we see here uh, in a typical 1D spectrum, uh, this is what the three parameters mainly you will see. Uh, one is called the chemical shifts. Uh, that is the peak positions. You will uh, see what is called spin spin couplings. So, this is something also we know as J coupling and we saw that it causes a split in the peak and there are small multiplets are seen and this has lot of information about the structure of the molecule. So, therefore, it is very imp uh, important to also analyze the data in uh, with respect to spin spin couplings. Uh, and then the next parameter which is important for analysis is intensity. So, intensity is basically the area under the peak. Uh, so, that again I will go through that very briefly. Uh, so, it is what happens is as uh, written here many times it is not possible to assign all the chemical shift to the spectrum is complex. So, what we typically do is that we only look at the region of interest. Uh, we'll, uh, for example, it says here that if there is a substitution reaction uh, in a chemistry suppose that there is a benzene ring which gets substituted with some functional group. Uh, what we do is we just look at the aromatic region because we know that the aromatic region has to undergo a change if there is a substitution. So, we do not look at the entire NMR spectrum uh, of the molecule, but we only focus on the aromatic. So, basically the idea here is that uh, if you have an unknown compound, then of course, you have to look at the full NMR spectrum and you have to analyze the full data. But if you have uh, only are looking at changes in the spectrum, so if you let us say you have a reaction uh, going on and you know the starting compound and you have the spectrum of that and you have analyzed already the spectrum of the starting compound. Now, you are only interested in then looking at the changes happening in the molecule upon uh, substitution or any reaction. So, in that scenario you do not have to reanalyze the full spectrum typically what is done is we only look at the region of interest. So, this is uh, again the repeat of the previous slide which says what are the different parameters that we have to focus on. Uh, in NMR spectrum uh, so that we can analyze. Uh, so, we will uh, uh, go through this uh, as we go on. So, the main thing about the intensity of a peak, uh, what is an intensity? The intensity is basically the area, so area which is proportional to the number of hydrogens that generate the peak. So, this is very important point here is because you know area gives you the total number of protons and therefore, what we do is we do not actually look at the absolute area, the absolute integration of the peak but we only look at the relative uh, intensity. So, for example, let us say you have uh, 3 hydrogens uh, CH3, CH2, OH suppose you take a molecule ethanol, you expect uh, the methyl peak CH3 to have 3 times the intensity as the uh, OH peak which has only 1 hydrogen. So, the number of hydrogens is, uh, is obtained relatively from the number of from the integration value. So, the integration value is very helpful for interpretation. So, uh, we will see this now uh, as we go on how these three parameters namely chemical shift, J, J, J coupling and structure uh, intensity is used. Now, one thing one has to understand in NMR spectroscopy is that suppose you know the structure of a molecule, uh, if you know uh, the molecular structure you can go from go and generate an NMR spectrum and this is in computer. So, if you know if I know the structure of a molecule I can generate NMR spectrum. And similarly, if I know the spectrum of a molecule, I can get the structure of the molecule. So, this is this is process is what typically we do all the time going from the right side that is NMR spectrum to the left side which is the molecular structure. But uh, this is not fairly easy. What is easy is this side going from a structure to spectrum is fairly easy compared to going from spectrum to structure. So, that is the difficult part and why is this so? Uh, the reason is that is when you know if you know the structure of a molecule, uh, you know the chemical composition, you know the various chemical environment around each hydrogen. So, you can actually compute calculate 
the electron densities around every each and every hydrogen because you know the structure exactly. So, there are a lot of softwares available these days which can generate the uh, chemical shifts because chemical shifts remember comes mainly because of the electron density. So, the electron density around a hydrogen atom determines uh, the chemical shift the shielding factor and the shielding factor can be very easily calculated if you know the structure. So, generating um, NMR spectrum means calculating or figuring or predicting a spectrum knowing the structure is very straightforward, but this reverse uh, the inverse approach is very complicated. So, in some cases of course, very easy to do that. So, that is where the examples which we will take uh, today and, um, and later in the next few uh, lectures uh, the, the spectrum we will analyze is very simple molecules. So, there in such situation it is very straightforward. But if you want to go back uh, from structure to a, spectra, a spectrum to a structure for a complicated molecule such as biomolecules like peptides, proteins, it is a really a very complicated task. So, it takes years of experience uh, given a spectrum to how to get the structure because there are a lot of manual work involved as well as uh, software uh, computational methods involved. So, our focus will be basically in this part of the course is to look at a simple 1D small simple molecules with 1D spectrum and that is mainly proton spectrum uh, in the next few class, but we can of course, we will also include carbon spectrum as we go to the next part. So, let us look at what determines the chemical shifts of a molecule. So, there are a few rules of course, this is not an is not going to be an exhaustive list of all the rules uh, which you have there is a very nice book uh, called by fibrolin uh, 1D and 2 dimensional MR from where this content has been taken. Uh, if you go through that book you will see many more rules of predicting chemical shifts. So, we are now looking at uh, now we are basically looking at this part. So, given a structure can I predict the chemical shift value of a proton. So, we are now going from this to this uh, later on we will go from here to here. So, let us see given a structure what are the or how what are the formulas or what are the ways we can look at uh, generate predict the values of chemical shift. So, chemical so NMR spectrum basically means chemical shifts. So, one of the very first uh, basic rule is Schulrich's rule. Uh, here it is applicable to molecules alkanes which are of this type of uh, structure. So, you have two CH 2s <coughs> geminal uh, I mean uh, vicinal CH 2s and these two uh, uh, CH 2s are attached to another functional group some functional group which may be any any particular uh, functional group we do not know that a priori, but let us say this is x and y. So, therefore, because this x is not same as this y, uh, we these two hydrogens are not chemically equivalent means these two hydrogens are different from these two hydrogens. But if x and y are same in that situation we will have a symmetry and in such a case then there is a symmetry between the two and then these two will become equivalent. But if x is not equal to y then see these two CH 2s are not equivalent. So, now let us say how do we calculate a chemical shift value of a CH 2 group based on the substituents x and y. Okay. So, this is what is shown here that there is a formula called Schulrich's rule which says that you calculate using this approach. You add 0.23 ppm to the delta x and delta y. What are these delta x and delta y? There is, is delta is a contribution to the chemical shift from x and y substituents. So, this is given in this table. Of course, remember this table is again not exhaustive uh, as written here you can actually get more exhaustive uh, list from this particular book. So, you can see here for example, if I have a substituent CH 3 on x uh, and then what I have to do is simply add 0 0.47 to 0 0.23 for this particular depending on what is x. Similarly, if I have y another CH 3 then I have to basically again add this or if I have some other group. So, because we are say assuming that x is not same as y, if I take some other substituent for y let us say I take this carboxylate or ester group uh, ester moiety, then I have to add 1.5 ppm to 0.23. So, that means for a CH 2 group here if x is CH 3 and y is COOR, then you will you will be getting a value for this CH 2 like this 0 0.23 plus 0 0.47 plus 1.55. So, this is basically how we can calculate for any given functional group for x and y and then predict the value of CH 2. The same thing can be done for this CH 2 as well.
of course, this delta contribution delta contribution it changes whether x is here or here for example, this is 2 bonds away. So, therefore, the this delta y what is given here delta is basically for 1 bond contribution for 2 bond contribution you have to it will be little less and in this book you will get more details on that. But the take home from this slide essentially is there are well defined ways to calculate the chemical shift of a molecule proton based on very simple ideas and simple rule provided uh, you know the structure of the molecule. <coughs> so, let us look at some examples of this case uh, let us say we have an amino acid called glycine in a glycine you can see here the x is COOH and the y is NRR. So, if I want to calculate the chemical shift of this CH2 then what I will do I will use this Schulderis rule and you would add this 0.23 and then you add 1.55 we saw that for COOH in the previous uh, slide and 1.5 for NRR 1.57. So, you will get around 3.35 and interestingly it turns out that then experimentally when I mean you actually record a spectrum 1D proton spectrum of glycine you will get a value around point around 3.5. So, you see it is pretty well very much matching within error uh, a little bit of error uh, with the chemical shift. So, you can see this theoretic this is a theoretical prediction. So, what we are doing here we have theoretically predicting the value of the chemical shift based on the rules and that seems to match very well with the and so this is an empirical formula. Now, there is another rule called Pascal Meyer Simon rule where you can use again this is now meant for molecules which have some structures like this ok and in this particular situation again if you look at this hydrogen atom you are trying to calculate the chemical shift of this hydrogen it depends on what are the substituents present here here and in this geminal position and cis and trans. So, you can see this is how we calculate you take the you add 5 point this is a constant take a 5 point all these are derived empirically based on the observed spectrum and a large database large number of molecules uh, spectrum which were recorded and then from there it has been calculated. So, again this is taken from this book by Horst Fibrolin and the that book has much many more details uh, substituent values given. So, here so let us take this particular case. So, you have 5.28 plus you add the delta geminal. So, depending on what is present in the geminal uh, from this list here you take this contribution. So, for example, let us say this uh, hydrogen is present in a geminal position here. So, in this molecule if there is a hydrogen uh, nothing is added to this that means, it is 5.28 remains as such. So, it does, does not contribute to the chemical shift of this hydrogen I mean to this con formula. And then you have a cis here delta cis that is it is a cis position again hydrogen does not contribute and similarly trans. So, basically if you have all this substituents as hydrogen there is no substituent it is all our hydrogen this is basically ethylene and if you recollect ethylene molecule we saw the chemical shift was around 5.23 or 5.28 which is shown here ok. So, that is a pure ethylene, but now you start substituting different functional groups then you have to use this table to calculate the contribution of each of these groups to the total chemical shift value. So, let us take for example, here see methyl see if I have a methyl here methyl here and a methyl here. So, suppose I have all the three positions methyl all I have to do is simply add 0 0.44 plus minus 0 0.26 minus 0 0.29 roughly they will cancel out it will have a little bit of negative and this will be subtracted that negative will be subtracted from 5.28. So, we based on this approach uh, you can now extend this to different functional groups you can take all combination you can have a chlorine atom at this position and you can consider hydrogen here methyl here and all possible combinations. So, you can see this is a very interesting thing what this rule says that all these rules which are we are looking at right now it says that it is a linear additive effect to chemical shifts. So, that is a very interesting thing and that is why as I mentioned that is very easy to go from a structure if you know the structure to the spectrum that means that is to calculate the chemical shift knowing it vice versa uh, it is little complicated. So, now let us see here in the example the application of this Pascal Meyer Simon rule uh, you can see here that in this particular case there are phenyl substituents phenyl group may benzene rings phenyl groups on this cis position uh, geminal position and the trans position whereas, hydrogen is here. So, based on this previous slide here you can see for the phenyl group what are the contributions to be taken into account based on their position and hydrogen also we know what is the values to be added. 
So, that is what he is shown here that you basically get when you add these two contributions you will get 6.53 uh, because remember hydrogen is 0. So, hydrogen is not coming into picture here. Uh, so, this is 6.5 and this very well matches very nicely uh, with the experimentally absorbed value. Okay. So, that is very interesting. Similarly, if you look at trans still bin, this was cis still bin. If you look at trans still bin, now the pH, the methaphenyl group is in the cis position, whereas this is in the geminal, and this hydrogen has come to the trans. So, again, if you look at this contribution, again, hydrogen, this hydrogen is not contributing according to the rule and it has no uh, zero contribution. So, we are only looking at the phenyl rings, and base this is all looking at this table here. So, you can see for phenyl ring, if it is in the cis position it has to be 0.37 and if it is geminal is 1.35 and that is what is done here. You add 1.35 plus 0.37 to 5.28 you get 7 ppm again matches very nicely with the experimentally observed value. So, you see this formulas has been have been generated based on observing the chemical shifts of a large number of molecules and then dissecting out the contributions of each of this functional group to a given hydrogen. So, we go to the next rule which is applicable to derivatives of benzene. Uh, remember in a phenyl ring in aromatic ring you have substituents at different positions you can have at ortho, meta and para and each of these groups contribute in a different manner. So, this again if you recollect uh, we saw this in the mesomeric effect um, or inductive effect where we see that depending on where the substituents are there could be a resonance structure and shift of the electron the charges around this different carbon atom and based on that the para meta ortho play a different role uh, in different roles in uh, contributing to the chemical shift. So, therefore, here also you can see that for a given substituent in this column its contribution when it is present in different position has been written here shown here and they are all different values. So, you see the same C H 3 group whether it is in the ortho position or meta or para it has slightly different contributions to the total chemical shift. Same thing with the OH it is uh, uh, depending on very differently. So, if it is in meta its contribution is very much different from ortho and para. Typically ortho and para ortho and para uh, contribute to the similar order whereas, meta you will see in many cases are widely different. So, this is typically the trend we see that the ortho and meta ortho and para position contribute to this position this hydrogen atom in a similar to the similar order whereas, meta has a completely different uh, contribution. So, we can con just simply add up all these values uh, depending on where it is present and we can calculate. So, 7.27 is basically the standard here when all the substituents there is no substituent and all are hydrogens protons. So, when the full all are protons basically it becomes a pure benzene ring and a benzene ring benzene has chemical shift of this. So, that is why when you have hydrogens you have to make it 0 there is no contribution of hydrogens here 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 to this chemical shift it will be already taken into account into this value and that is 0.27. So, let us see some uh, calculation some examples of this case. Uh, so, you can see this is para nitronisole uh, here you can see this now nitro group is in the para position and we are trying to now calculate the chemical shift of these hydrogens. So, we are looking at this hydrogens, this hydrogens and these two hydrogens. So, you can see for calculating for number 2, now 2 as when you look at hydrogen in position 2, now we are looking at the contribution of OCS3 which is ortho to 2 and it is meta for NO2. Okay. So, similarly it is the same for 6, when you look at 6 they are these two are now chemical equivalent. So, we consider them together they are one chemical shift because of a symmetry axis here. So, these two are equivalent similarly 3 and 5 are equivalent. So, when 2 and 6 we are considering we have to look at the contribution of the NO2 in the meta position to this 6 chemical shift here of 6. So, you can go back to the list here we can see that in the meta position if CS if it is ortho position if there is a CS3 it has this value of minus 0.17 and nitro in the uh, meta position has this value. So, that is what is shown is OCS3. So, uh, if you go back the OCS3 is shown here. So, in the ortho position you have to take into account this number here minus 0.43 and for nitro in the meta position it is 0.17 and that is what is done here minus 0.43 plus 0.17. So, 7.27 was our base value. So, you get 7.0 7 
which is again very close to what you expect up experimentally. Now, if you look at these two hydrogens 3 and 5 in the similar manner we can now calculate the contributions of OCH3 which is now meta to 5 and meta to 2 or meta to 3 and nitro group is now ortho to 5 and ortho to 3 and therefore, you have to look into the table in the previous slide and you will get the values like this. So, if you add all of them you get say 8.13 and again very very close uh, to the experimentally. So, typically of course, the rule of thumb in NMR is the generally 0 0.02 or 0 0.03 in proton values are within the error. This you can probably consider it as slightly away from the experimental value is about 0 0.12 ppm. But remember in a proton 0 0.02 is really close you cannot get better than this because the error value in measuring based on the line weight and so on um, again depends on the spectrometer we use uh, typically 0 0.02, 0 0.03 would be the best resolution or good resolution which you can expect to get in a NMR experiment spectrometer. So, now that is basically how we look at analysis of 1D NMR spectrum uh, we as I said if you want to look at. So, what we saw in the previous slide what basically all the uh, different formula rules we I only showed about 3 rules uh, there are as you say the n number of rules uh, which we would not be able to cover in detail each and every rule in this course. Therefore, I would strongly recommend to go through this book by Horst Febrolin and many other books have these formulas and uh, you, this is good database it is like a reference formula you do not have to memorize them, but one has one can keep them in their in, in your uh, handbook as a reference. So, whenever you want to and basically all the softwares whatever we have these days uh, they implement all these rules. So, when we come to later part I will I will give you a list of software and uh, which we nowadays are very popularly used many of them are freely available on the internet can be downloaded and used and all this uh, software basically are implementing this type of formulas. So, now we will now come to the second part where we will given a um, spectrum can we predict the structure. So, this is the reverse approach. So, in the previous approach was given a structure already given if I know the structure can I predict the chemical shift value and that is very easy as I said, uh, but if you know the structures uh, spectrum and you want to get to the structure that is not straightforward. The reason being that you do not have any clue about what functional groups are present all you will have is a molecular formula this is what is say the first thing you should know if you want to go from a spect uh, spectrum to structure you should very well be aware of the molecular formula. Without molecular formula it is very difficult to uh, figure out what the structure could be. So, one should have at least a basic idea or accurate idea about the molecular formula that means what are the uh, CH how many carbons how many oxygens how many nitrogen are present. You may not be knowing whether there is an ester group or in a carboxylate group or an aldehyde group or an alcohol so on that is fine and that is not required that we will use based on our known ideas, but at least one should know accurately that how many carbons are there, how many hydrogens are present in your molecule and how many uh, uh, this one uh, how many nitrogens are present. So, we look at all these things now. So, now one of the once the molecular formula is known the next step is to scan the spectrum and see how many types of protons you are able to see in the spectrum. So, this are of course, the all these rules we will uh, go through it again in a real example. So, the point here is that remember a type of protons what do you mean by proton type it means that this set of protons will have the same chemical shift value they are chemically equivalent. So, let us say in CH3, CH2, OH if you see uh, in this method ethanol you have CH3 which is one type, CH2 which is another type and OH is third type. So, you see there are three types of protons in this molecule that means CH3 will give you one peak, CH2 will give you another peak, OH will give third peak. So, based on looking at the number of peaks in the spectrum corresponds to number of types of protons. Okay. So, this is the very typically uh, the second step after you know the chemical formula this is the second step you have to scan the spectrum or look at inspect the spectrum to look at the number of protons in your sample in your molecule. Then once you know the number of protons what you have to do is next start analyzing the J coupling pattern. Okay. So, J coupling is a uh, pattern is very important because J coupling tells you the nearby number of hydrogen for example, in CH3, CH2, OH again taking the ethanol uh, you see that in CH2 we will have a quartet because of splitting of because of the 3 protons 
uh, methyl CH3 will have a triplet because of two protons and remember all this triplet, quartet, and all etcetera is coming from the Pascal triangle which we saw in the last uh, few previous classes. We will go through that again quickly. So, uh, analyzing a J coupling pattern is very important next step. So, first you know the number of protons present in your molecule, then you look at the J coupling uh, pattern uh, and then once you know these three, once you know these two things, the next step is basically low looking at the integral or area of the peaks to get the number of protons for each peak. And this is very important because now next thing is once you know the number of protons, types of protons present, you need to know how many protons are present in each type. So, let us again take the example of ethanol which is CH3, CH2OH in that molecule, CH3 has 3 protons, CH2 has 2 protons and OH is 1 proton. So, you can see if you look at the integral, you would ex you should expect to get a integration like 3 is to relative integration, remember we are always talking about relative in NMR is 3 is to 2 is to 1. Okay. So, relative integration now helps you to know uh, that how many protons are present uh, in each type and that information is very useful uh, because once unless you know the number of protons in of each type, uh, you will never you will not be able to figure out whether the total number of protons are matching with your molecular formula. So, remember the molecular formula gives you the total number of hydrogens in your molecule and that should match with the total relative peak. So, for example, again coming to this 3 is to 2 is to 1, that means I should expect 6 protons 3 plus 2 plus 1 and so in CH3, CH2, OH there are 6 protons. So, you see the number of protons which I can cal which I will calculate from peak integral should match exactly the number of protons available to me in the formula. Otherwise, if there is a mismatch then you would not be able to analyze because that means there is a missing proton somewhere that will not help you to analyze. So, missing protons is the only information available is here. Of course, many times th this is based this the whole uh, the sequence shown here is only for the hydrogen spectrum, but remember uh, we can also use the carbon 13 NMR spectrum uh, to also get information on the type of carbon here. So, the molecular formula has also an enhanced. So, remember we are going to look at only organic compounds in the next uh, this one, uh, few slides. So, the organic compound is what we are going to analyze not uh, biomolecule as of now. So, in organic compounds the main uh, molecule atoms are carbon and hydrogen. So, the carbon spectrum is also in, in essential, but at this stage uh, in the next uh, class we will see that how we can use mainly based on proton spectrum uh, to get from the structure formula molecular uh, spectrum the spectrum of the molecule to the structure. And from that itself for very simple molecules a hydrogen spectrum is sufficient to do that but uh, the carbon spectrum also is useful when you go to more complicated molecule. So, we will see this in the next class how hydrogen spectrum can be analyzed based on these rules.